name's Richard Greenwood. I'm the CEO of Radicate, a specialist clean air technology company. And I'm going to talk to you about air pollution, particularly on the importance of addressing indoor air pollution. So, there's a lot of media attention on air pollution at the moment, and rightly so. Um, there's also quite a bit of media attention on air pollution without us knowing quite that it is air pollution. So at the moment we're going through a flu season and airborne pathogens still air pollution. Um, I think in the UK, we're, we're a global company, but in the UK certainly the focus is on diesel fumes and traffic pollution. Um, but what I want to talk to you more about today is indoor air quality and the importance of solving this. And the reason I'm going to talk to you about this is because in the news what we see is air pollution and it's about outdoor air pollution and long-term strategies that we need to implement to address this. But the fact is that indoor air pollution kills more people annually. Indoor air pollution is what we suffer most from because we spend 90% of our time indoors. And indoor air pollution is the thing we can solve today with the right technology. Uh, we'll start by just playing you a short clip, it's only a two minute clip, uh, and this is something that we engaged in recently, uh, just a few months ago in London, um, with a nursery in London, and they contacted us because they were on a list of a thousand nurseries who were told they had illegal levels of air pollution, particularly NO2. So they tried to get help from the, the, the source that told them they had this problem, um, but there wasn't much help available. So they contacted us to say, what can we do? So if you could play this clip, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, perfect. should perhaps be something they don't have to worry about. But we know there are hundreds of nurseries in the capital located on or very close to what are dangerously polluted roads. Now, because of their concerns about the impact that can have on the health of children, one private nursery today took the step of installing air purifiers in its buildings, a move Greenpeace says should be considered across the capital. Martin Stew reports. You're not allowed to use a mobile phone at this Montessori nursery in Islington. The staff try to shield children from the distractions of city living to focus on creative play. But what they can't stop are the toxic fumes billowing from traffic outside their front door. All the cars and the buses, they blow up this dirty smoke that pollutes the air. But it's one of 761 nurseries in London within 150 metres of a road breaching legal NO2 levels. 24 are near roads so bad, levels are double the legal limit. Is it good for us to breathe the dirty air? No, that's why the Clean Air Paris comes out and they clean all these dirty air. Parents were so worried when they saw the research, they demanded the nursery take action. But save not breathing, options seemed limited. What support are we actually being given? As I say, we did go to the, um, the campaigns that the, the mayor had actually indicated, but that's not going to happen overnight. Uh, so obviously, from my point of view, as a business and an environment working with young children, what could I do very quickly? Their solution? An air filter using technology developed by NASA for the International Space Station. At the bottom, we have filters, then a fan, and then, as you can see on this picture, this is the technology lots of ultraviolet lights, titanium dioxide, which creates a reaction that neutralizes nano-sized particles. So that's taking out the nitrogen dioxide that we're getting from the traffic? Exactly. It's that gas which is responsible for nearly two-thirds of the 9,400 premature deaths caused by air pollution in London every year. It's particularly problematic for children because it can restrict lung growth. 
But the problem is this technology does not come cheap. One of those boxes will set you back about a thousand pounds and you need one in each room plus the cost of changing the filters. Now this is a private nursery so they can afford it but many of the hundreds on the most at risk list in London simply can't. Greenpeace says the mayor should consider funding the technology now whilst his office work on longer term solutions. It could be a part of a two pronged solution where there is emphasis on reducing uh, traffic on the streets right outside the nurseries and at the same time then tackling the uh, indoor air pollution using these kind of uh, system. So it has to be a part of the larger solution, can't just be the only solution. A spokesman from the mayor's office says they're currently auditing 50 primary schools but may consider looking at nurseries in the future. So Martin, that was just one private nursery that you went to today. Are others likely to follow suit, do you think? Well, this is the big question. As with any of the mayor's policies, there's lots of talk, grand talk, but there's not a huge amount of detail. In fact, he's not going to publish that until next year. What we do know is the company make those filters. After a month, we'll be monitoring and sending that back to his experts. And if they can make enough of a case, he might consider it. But a little uh, calculation by me, back of an envelope stuff, to do that across all those nurseries will cost somewhere between five and ten million pounds. So it's a big decision for them to make. OK, Martin, thanks very much. So it, it was a really successful campaign for us, actually. Um, and it was great to do something here in the UK, uh, especially uh, for children. Uh, from the back of that, we are monitoring air pollution levels. We've solved the nitrogen dioxide levels within that nursery. Um, and we did go and see the mayor's office in London to say, look, this is what we're doing off, off the back of this. Now, the mayor's office is very concentrated on uh, minimizing outdoor air pollution outside schools um, by building hedges, moving doorways, uh, and, and things like that. So we're trying to fight this cause of if we solve the indoor air pollution where children spend most of their time, maybe the health benefits will be a lot better. And what the funds are being spent on at the moment might slightly need to be put in other areas within certain schools. So one of the schools, which is actually the second most polluted school in London, has also contacted us to say, look, we've seen what you've done in this nursery, We'd like you to come along and do some tests in our school. We then want you to put your technology into this school. And then we want to go back to the mayor's office and say, here's the result. We're halfway through that. But the very interesting thing that we found when we put an independent company in to do the tests, and the tests on particulate matter, on VOCs, and on NO2 particularly, were that in this enclosed classroom space we did the tests, which is by a very busy road, when there was a lot of traffic outside, the NO2 levels inside the classroom went up. When there was an idling bus outside, the NO2 levels inside the classroom went up. So the reality is that right now for us, fighting the cause for let's give clean air inside, we're trying to gather this evidence, especially where children and the education sector are concerned in the UK. what I was talking about, long-term strategies to solve outdoor air pollution. Like the spokesperson from Greenpeace said, they're really important. You know, we need to address this, it's really important, but they are long-term, and we're never going to fully solve it. You drive a car down the road, you've got particulate matter. You know, we're never going to solve outdoor air pollution 100%, and it is a long-term strategy. How many years are we saying it's going to take before we slowly get rid of diesel emissions? But right now, people are suffering, especially children. And what we can do with the right technology today is solve that indoor air pollution. So why am I on this journey and Radicate as a company? In 2009, I started uh, working as a consultant and taking new technologies to market. And um, in 2011, I saw what was happening with uh, clean air technologies and air pollution in general and my father uh, uh, developed COPD so I looked at the market to see what can I do to create the best possible indoor air quality for you and what I found was a series of uh, mechanical filters like your typical air purifier but looking into that and looking into their test results I wasn't satisfied that this was actually good enough technology to solve what I was looking to solve 
So I set up my company, Radicate. And in 2015, I went over South Korea and I partnered up with uh, the world's leading clean air technology company, Iron Bear. Um, in the UK, we now design and develop the technology and in South Korea, they manufacture it and, and implement it. And, and we have various distribution channels. So 2017, we've launched a, a, a new range of technology and we're, as well as providing technology, trying to educate in various different countries on the importance of clean indoor air. So the benefits of clean indoor air. We've talked generally about children improving their health. Um, there's so many studies now which, which are really valuable studies showing that it reduces stress levels. It increases the attention span of people in offices or in the education sector. It can reduce uh, the impacts of allergies or asthma. And generally when we look at offices, they say they have a cycle which goes around. You know, you have the hay fever and then you go to flu and colds and it's a vicious cycle. Um, cleaning indoor air environments can boost productivity levels by up to 16%, and this is studied by the EPA. And slowly but surely, over the last four years, the percentage has gone up. It started at 6%, a study came out. We can improve productivity levels by 6%, and now they're saying 16%. So the reality of creating clean indoor air environments, not just within the education sector, but within any, any kind of working environment, is that it starts to become quite a cost-effective thing to do. Because if you can improve your productivity levels, if you can reduce your sickness rates, if you can stop things like allergies, asthma, hay fever, then it becomes quite a cost saving, not a, a, a cost. So good indoor air quality. We've just gone over all this. And, and ultimately, what I'm going to touch on shortly is your bottom line. So with a lot of businesses, money talks. We can also talk about the bottom line within the education sector. Because if you think about this process, a piece of technology goes into a classroom. It does all of these positive benefits, but you know, it costs money to put that technology into a classroom or into an office. So do those benefits then outweigh that cost? Uh, it's really simple, that, that they really do. The, the, the costs of putting something into an office, say a piece of technology will cover 20 staff in an office. That piece of technology will cost you 60 pounds a month. So you work that round to maybe <coughs> 10 pence per member of staff per day for indoor air quality. So even if the statistics online are wrong, and you don't get anywhere near 16% increased productivity, say you get 3% increased productivity, and say you reduce sickness levels by only 5% and not what we've calculated maybe 30%, it's still a huge cost saving by offering indoor air quality. And I go back to that point where we can do this tomorrow with the right technology. So looking at indoor air quality within healthcare. Within healthcare in the UK, all of us have probably gone to the doctors or certainly gone to hospital, and there's such a push to wash your hands or clean your hands. It's very important. So direct contact and indirect contact, to solve this is the premise of infection prevention and control in the UK. And the reality right now is we're in a flu epidemic or a flu season, let's say. If there is flu within a hospital, you will see that they close down that hospital and people put masks on their faces. Why? It's in the air, right? So surely we have to take in for good infection prevention and control practices, we have to look at the air. We have to look at not just airborne uh, uh, germs, but airborne viruses, respiratory viruses such as influenza. There was a study came out a few weeks ago which said just by breathing you can spread influenza. 
So it does not make sense that we put all this time, effort and money into reducing healthcare associated infections with just direct contact and indirect contact without addressing the air. In South Korea, where our partners are based, they have 350,000 installations of clean air technology and most of the hospitals have this technology installed. Every lung examination room in South Korea has to have high level clean air technology installed. So surely the, the development of this has to be, we recognize that it's airborne because we put these masks on. So let's clean the air because the reality is that most of these masks, they're not fitted to your face. Air takes the most direct route, so it will get inside there. Unless you've got somebody having a, a mask fitting service and it's fully sealed, it's not working the way you think it's working. Yet, if you have clean air technology, which is forced and it's in situation, so it's giving you real time protection against airborne pathogens, you will find a reduction in your cross contamination rate. We did a study in 2016, the end of 2016, and we asked 500 people, are you concerned about sitting in a healthcare or a doctor's or hospital waiting room? And 92% of people said they were concerned. Some of those people even said, I will only go to the doctors when absolutely necessary. And that's that old wives tale, even my grandma used to say it, you go to the doctors to get sick. So are they concerned about what they're touching? Are they concerned about what's touching them? Or are they concerned about what they're breathing in? Most of those 92% are concerned about what they're breathing in, about who they're sat next to. When you go onto an aeroplane, are you concerned about what you're touching around you? Or are you concerned about that person behind you sneezing? So it makes sense, we know this. And, and for us, it's time to bring air into hands and surfaces with, within the healthcare sector. Uh, uh, yeah, this, this generally um, uh, explains it all for us because if people are asking for it, there's a reason why. Um, this year, really, we're launching a campaign called We Share Clean Air. We launched it last year, but we're doing a lot of development work on it this year. So the reason we're launching this is because if people have good clean air technology, they should benefit from it in many ways. So for example, if I go into a, a doctor's and I'm sat in the waiting room and uh, there's somebody there coughing and sneezing either side of me, but I see a big symbol saying we share clean air, we've got technology installed here which is killing all of those airborne pathogens, the receptionists are really happy because they have to deal with this uh, all day, every day, then I'm going to go in to see my uh, doctor in the right frame of mind. Instead of thinking I've got a sore elbow but now I've got flu, I'm thinking, well, that's great, you're really protecting us here. So, so we've come up with this global campaign called We Share Clean Air, and slowly this year we're going to bring in other technologies into this to say, you now have a, a, a certification, a brand which people can show either in their offices to show people that I'm going above and beyond for my employees, for my visitors, for healthcare settings, for schools, etc. So it's a fact that air purification devices around the world are changing from a luxury item into a must-have appliance, especially in some parts of the world, especially if you go over to the east. But here, we've been on the stand today, and a lot of people who've come to visit us have some form of air purification device in their home. So if this is becoming the norm in people's homes, it needs to be adapted into our medical sector the education sector, the working sector, because it's standard practice for us. We, we understand the importance of it in our homes. This needs to spread into the working environment. So, five objectives for the government. 
Healthy levels of dust and ultrafine dust, control levels of formaldehyde and VOCs, achieve sufficient airflow, eradicate indoor air pathogens, maintain CO2 at healthy levels. This is the government regulations in South Korea. So we recently, this year, we've won a, a very large tender in South Korea to supply our technology to every single classroom. We went up against Samsung and LG who put their best uh, technology forward. Um, and the only, we, the only reason we won the tender is because we ticked each one of the five boxes. The one that we struggled on is CO2 levels. Um, our technology ticked all the other boxes. So we've now developed a system that can bring in fresh air when it needs to. Um, but the point to this slide is that how forward thinking is this? So how forward thinking is it to say that we understand the problem and we're going to implement a national solution to this problem within every single classroom? So over the next two years in South Korea, every single classroom will control everything in the air that can cause a problem to the health of children. Some indoor air pollutants. So we think of indoor air pollutants, I think quite often we think of maybe particulate matter, uh, dust, ultrafine dust, um, Carbon dioxide is mentioned a lot in, in the UK. It's very difficult to get rid of. Uh, there's a lot of nanoparticles associated with that, so you can't catch it. A standard air purification device might be 30% efficient, so you need some technology to get rid of those nanoparticles. Um, you'll find that air purifiers do advertise on things like mold and bacteria because they're maybe a micrometer in size and filters will go down to 0.3 micrometers, so they will catch that. But whereas viruses can go down to nanometers, uh, uh, they'll get, or the most percentage of them will get through uh, um, uh, standard filters. So toxic gas and VOC is again difficult to catch. In the UK, we use activated carbon. Uh, activated carbon has quite a short lifespan in a stable equilibrium. If you put it into um, an environment where you've got ultraviolet light or maybe hydroxyl radicals, it will last up to 20 times longer. So there is a real science to cleaning indoor air properly. What we do as Bradicator Company, these are our kind of solutions. And uh, two years ago when I joined forces with IMB Air, we took it right back to basics. We looked at um, how do we create a product which will give you an overall total clean indoor air environment and what we looked at first is mechanical filtration so using filters which a standard air purification device will do and then secondly when nanoparticles which are really damaging to your health they get deeper into your lungs get past filters how do we deal with those and that's where the technology comes into play last year we were involved in the international um, clean air technology awards and we actually seated second place the good thing about that is what we saw is that there are so many new technologies coming onto the market addressing indoor air quality that we're now over the next two years going to have a spike in real technologies for cleaning indoor air which for us is great it's not just about our technology it's about this becoming a real focus we've already talked about this in most cases there is no cost to solving indoor air quality there is only a cost saving um, and I'm happy to talk about this personally with anybody this in the healthcare sector from the education sector from offices we can display how the right technology will save money not cost money and that's it thank you very much for listening may I have any questions Hello. Thank you for your presentation. I'm from Maidstone Borough Council. I'm a councillor, so I'm particularly interested with what you have to say. However, uh, our borough is uh, largely rural. Mm -hmm. Now, would I be correct in assuming that really you're aimed at, say, town centres and basically urban areas? Uh, 
Yes and no. Only when we're talking about uh, the addition of traffic pollution. So, so all indoor air environments have got lots and lots of air pollutants. So, so for example, when you bring children into a classroom, they're bringing in a lot of particulate matter. Anything, any kind of furnishings there is, is off-gassing, so it's releasing formaldehyde. So generally, when you go into any environment, any office, any school, and you do an air quality test, the parameters of that are above the recommended level. So clean indoor uh, or indoor air technology is applicable in most instances. So the answer isn't just being a fresh air fiend and opening a window? No, absolutely right. not. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So, um, I'm on the flash here. I'm from Sydney Morning Kent. Oh, yeah. And we were actually doing the morning school with this kit. So, if you want to touch hands with me later, I'll okay, show you. Thank you. All right. Hi. Yeah, I was talking to your colleague earlier on about uh, we've got a lot of call centres. Mm -hmm. I think one up by you at Atkinson. Uh, so, I would do so much about but also because I work for BT, mm -hmm. we've also got a lot of people on the road at any one time. Have you considered? Yeah, well, we actually do a, a small unit and um, we've just sent a pallet load out to uh, Uber in Pakistan because they want to offer um, clean taxi rides. It's not really for a taxi because I don't know where they're going to install it. I'm sure they'll be creative and, and put it somewhere, but certainly for vans. So uh, uh, we're, we're working with a couple of companies to to kind of give them a clean van fleet. Um, the technology is about 30 centimeters high, about this big. So we can certainly install it into vans, but call centers is, is really interesting because when people are speaking a lot, they're prone to a lot of respiratory conditions. So having that clean indoor air environment in call centers is, is a huge cost saving, especially because so many people are so close together. You don't actually need that much technology to protect a large area. And the return on investments, you know, almost immediate. Any more questions? Hi. Do you feel, you know, most of the PM two point five mm -hmm. um, is actually generated through um, products for whom profits are being made? Uh, cars, mm -hmm. you know, and, and much of which we've been lied to in the past mm. about the polluting effects by those industries. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that, you know, as part of any campaign to do clean indoor air, we should be saying, well, actually, there should be larger taxes on the polluters to make them pay for the cost of the technology required? I mean, there's something paradoxical about sticking a clean air filter on a, a, ta a taxi in Pakistan. Which is probably diesel and probably uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely, yeah. So it's just like, just in terms of prime causes, it feels like a lot of a lot of this is ameliorative. That's right. I mean, it, it, you're right in what you say, and and yes, to some extent, I do agree. But we are implementing these changes, and and in some countries, it's a lot quicker to do than other countries. Um, uh, I think that it has to go hand in hand. And even with, one of the problems that a lot of people don't realize is because, because we're trying to be as energy efficient as we can, we seal up our buildings. And, and that's great. We solve energy efficiency. But what suffers is air quality. Because as that air recirculates and recirculates, you're taking those gases and chemicals and pathogens and, and, and it's just going round and round. And that joined up with the fact that we spend all of our time indoors now. You know, that's why indoor air quality is such a big health threat. It's, it's, it, and if we did open windows more, perfect. I mean, part of what we say to people it, when we do any installation is, make sure you open your windows half an hour a day. And even if they say, we're by a busy road, it doesn't matter. You know, you've got to bring in oxygen. You've got to bring in that. You've got to get your CO2 levels down. So, so I, I think that a lot of the perception has to change. And, and it's about educating the fact of, you know, you're not in your castle and you're safe. You're in your castle and there's a problem to deal with. Any other questions? Hi. Well, on the, um, the actual sensors that you put in, so for, particularly for schools, mm -hmm. what type of visual 
So we use we use standard uh, PM sensor and VOC sensors. So total VOC sensors. We also produce a handheld uh, sensor technology where people can go in and do some readings themselves. Mm -hmm. We're working currently with a, a new technology which is new to us called Pico, um, and they are uh, it's it's a, a university project in South Korea, and they're developing some really really unique little sensors. What we're trying to do with them is make the sensor more mobile, but it can still work with uh, any technology. So the sensor can be taken anywhere and it will turn up or down the, the, the unit as needed. Currently, we use sensors inside the technology so it can run automatically, which then turn it up when it needs to go up and turn it down to save ele electricity when it needs to go down. The sensors are actually coming really, really down in price right now. <laughs> And um, I was speaking recently in Smogathon with a company who planned to give out for free <laughs> 3 million PM sensors. They want to get data, the data is valuable to them, um, but they're going to do this later this year. So lots and lots of countries, they'll give out these sensors for free and then gather the data. Yeah, I guess the challenge with that is that it's so, um, it, it's dependent on the location. That's right, um, yeah, that's right. Right. You know, they, we find that clients are asking where you locate the sensors because mm -hmm. it's so subjective. So if you put a sensor in, in a school next to an open little window that is next to a road, obviously your yeah. value is going to be That's right. higher than, than other places. So I'm just wondering, you know, the robustness of the data in terms of... Yeah. And, and, and now wearable sensors are, are slowly becoming big. So we're working with a company in the US called WIND, which is W-Y-N-D. Um, and part of their technology is a wearable sensor. Mm -hmm. And what they're then also doing is uh, they've got an app which will, it's not so big in the UK, but it's, it's getting big in the US. So anybody can go on, see the data, and they can plan their routes to avoid air pollution as well, especially for, for prams. Mm -hmm. So it, it is becoming more and more, which is great because it's just that awareness is being built, not just inside, but, but outside too. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's a great idea, and yes, of course I would. <laughs> yeah, but would they wear it? Hi. Brilliant, I will give you one. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Just one more. Hello. Uh, open plan offices. Yeah. Uh, I heard you mention earlier about a, a sort of 20 people, but would it, could you still make it work effectively in an open plan office? Yeah, so it's just multiples thereof. Oh, so what, right. what we do is take the size or the schematics of uh, the layout of an office and, the and then yeah that's right and then say you, this is exactly what you need uh, to solve that office it, it, what we're actually doing as a company is we've looked at 20 different sectors so uh, as opposed to just say here's our technology and uh, it would be really beneficial for your health we looked at sectors and said these are the main pollutants within hair salons within uh, dentistry within and and here's how you solve it even now we're looking at within a dentist we're doing some uh, computer fluid dynamics to say here's where you position it for the best position because all, all of these things matter so what we would do for any open plan layouts is say you know how much airflow is coming in 
and, and this is then how, how many air changes do you want per hour and this is how we specify the units. Anything else? Khaled at the front is happy to give you any brochures on uh, our technology and a bit of information. Um, and if you'd like to come up and speak to me, I'm happy to speak to anybody. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.